A warm welcome to the Oxford University Scientific Society in week six, Hillary Town. This week, we have the chance to hear from one of the Society's old friends, Dr. Patricia Farah. Patricia is a historian of science at Clare College, University of Cambridge. She'll be talking about Isaac Newton, arguably one of the most famous scientists in history, and Newton's career in the few years he spent living in London. If you would like to know more about this topic, Patricia's new book, Life After Gravity, was published yesterday and now available for purchase online. Any questions for Patricia, please write them in the comments section and we'll be collecting them and presenting them to our speaker after the talk. That's all from me for now. Patricia, the stage is yours. Well, I can't see any of you, but hello everybody and thank you very much for coming. This is a very exciting event for me because as Luna said, my book was published yesterday. So you're the first people to hear about it since it's been published. And Newton lived in London for over 30 years, but that last period of his life is very rarely discussed. Instead, biographers focus on Woolsthorpe, where he supposedly sat under the apple tree that you can see on your screen at the moment and conceived the theory of gravity, or else they talk about his time at Trinity College, Cambridge, where he published the Principia, his great book on gravity. But he lived in a third place as well. He lived for over 30 years in London, where he ran the Royal Mint and he ran the Royal Society. So on the left, you can see at left bottom, you can see his house in St. Martin Street, which is near Leicester Square, but it was demolished in the early 20th century. But you can see from the plaque above uh, that he lived there um, for 17 years. And on the right, you can see a big portrait of himself that he donated to the Royal Society. He was very good at promoting his own reputation. And you can see at the top of the picture, there's some letters in gold. And those letters announce in Latin that he was the president of the Royal Society. And they also say equus, which is Latin for night. And as he grew older, he commissioned more and more portraits of himself, even though they were very expensive. So you can see here too by the same artist, Godfrey Neller, who's a very prestigious artist. He painted portraits of the royal family. And on the left, you can see a portrait that he painted just two years after Newton first published the Principia. It's quite a familiar picture. You can see that he conforms to our concept of what, what a genius might look like. He's got a very thin face. He's very pale. He's got those thin, delicate hands. The whole picture is very somber. And you can see he's got his own natural hair um, and it's already going gray. Now on the right, you can see a picture by the same artist that was painted six years after Newton went to London. And this sort of suggests quite a dramatic change in lifestyle. You can see he's wearing that very luxurious, long, curly wig, and he's got a velvet robe of crimson, which was his favourite colour. It was the favourite colour of royalty. He's also considerably plumper. Now, Victorian scientists hated that picture. They said it was an affected representation of Newton the dandy, the prosperous man of the world with a carriage and horses and three male and three female servants. So although they knew about this stage in his career, they preferred not to think about it. And their restricted view has limited our own. But I'm not a Victorian. And if this is precisely the cosmopolitan man about town that I'm going to be talking about. So by 1696, Newton had been trying to leave Cambridge for several years, and he eventually secured a job at London's Royal Mint, which was inside the Tower of London. And I chose this picture because you can see all the ships going backwards and forwards on the Thames. London was the centre of a global trading network, and he could see the ships going backwards and forwards they were Many of them were importing African gold for coins, as well as Asian goods for the rapidly growing luxury market. The tower was, of course, also a fortress. 
and the mint was squeezed into the narrow space between the outer fortifications. At first, Newton lived there as well as working there, but he didn't like it very much. It was incredibly noisy. Because it was a fortress, there was the noise of all the trooping soldiers. Uh, there were, look, you can see the cannon at the bottom of the le bottom left. And then I've shown a picture of some lions because there was also a zoo inside the Tower of London. So you could hear all the animals and I imagine it was pretty smelly as well. So he soon moved out to Westminster, which was a far more fashionable area. And this is the study from the inside of the house in St. Martin Street that I showed you before. When the house was demolished in the early 20th century, uh, someone packed up all the panelling and the furniture, all the panelling from the wall and the furnitures and curtains and everything else, and they got bought up by a rich American. And the Newton study has been recreated in Babson Business College, which is in the middle of Massachusetts. And I've been there. It's a really strange feeling because you go up in the lift in this modern business college and you cross the corridor and you open the door and suddenly you're in the 18th century. It's a very odd feeling. And there's, they've decorated it very well. It's sort of half a museum, half what it looked like when he lived there. And it's got great big, thick, red, crimson velvet curtains. It's got lots of luxurious furniture and chairs sitting around. So it gives you an, in, um, an idea that Newton lived very luxuriously, even though he's usually thought of as being rather a, a frugal, parsimonious sort of man. So I drew up a table which compares Newton's wealth when he died with a few of the other famous people in the 18th century. So you might well have heard of Hans Sloan. He was the founder of the British Museum. Uh, he was a very, very wealthy man. But you can see that Newton's twice as wealthy as George Handel or three times as wealthy as a chemist, Robert Boyle. So by 18th century standards, he was a pretty well off man. Although the conversion rates are difficult uh, to modern money. So this is in 18th century money, but it gives you some idea of how rich he was. And he had two main sources for his wealth. One was his salary at the Mint, and the other was investments in the stock market. And despite his reputation of frugality, when he died, there was an inventory of his possessions that covered 17 feet of a vellum scroll. And some of the items were silver. I'm just showing you some uh, an indication of some of the things that he owned. He owned silver candlesticks. He owned masses and masses of silver cutlery. There was his sword. And then he owned the ultimate Georgian luxury of two silver chamber pots. That's the item on the bottom left. And as another valuable possession, he commissioned this ivory bust of himself, uh, which is on the right. Ivory was a very, very expensive material. And David Le Marchand was a very, very distinguished sculptor. And you can see the picture on the left is of David Le Marchand. It was painted of him. He chose to hold the bust that he'd sculpted of Isaac Newton, and it's now in the British Museum. So Newton wasn't alone in buying expensive goods. Many of them in Ported. This was an age of rampant consumerism and economic growth. So the essayist Joseph Addison rejoiced that London had become an emporium for the whole earth. The single dress of a woman of quality is often a product of a hundred climates. The scarf is sent from the torrid zone, the brocade petticoat rises out of the mines of Peru, and the diamond necklace out of the bowels of Hindustan. If you look at that picture of those rather elaborately dressed children that I've shown on the right, it comes from a larger picture, which is this conversation piece by William Hogarth, one of the most famous artists of the 18th century. Its full title is The Indian Emperor or the Conquest of Mexico, as performed in the year 1731 in Mr. Conduit's Master of the Mint before the Duke of Cumberland. 
And you see, this is a full uh, size picture. Newton was already dead, but it's a very Newtonian picture. So you can see, for example, there's his bust on the mantelpiece. And at the bottom front, there's the royal governess, and she's telling her daughter to pick up a fan which has fallen through the power of Newtonian gravity. And there's a little makeshift stage at the front where four aristocratic children are performing a play. And the entire audience is made up of aristocrats and um, of some royal children and the parents of the children on the stage. So this picture, I think, illustrates quite well the circles that Newton moved in and the people he knew. His acquaintances were rich, they were powerful, and they included women as well as men. So I'm going to use this picture to structure the rest of my talk. So I'm going to start by talking about the room, then the audience, then the stage. So to start on the room, if you look at the top left, you can see a portrait of John Conduit, and beneath that is a picture of his wife, Catherine Barton. Catherine Barton was Isaac Newton's niece, and she acted as his housekeeper while he lived in London, and she married John Conduit, who succeeded Newton as master of the mint. And after Newton died, Conduit appointed himself uh, Newton's uh, I don't know, promotion agent, public, public relations agent, and he overtook all the publicity surrounding Newton. There's only one other surviving portrait of John Conduit, and that's on a medal that was produced um, by the Mint after he died. And you see on the left, he looks like a well-fed Roman emperor, and on the right, he's being ceremoniously presented to two residents of the Elysian fields after death. And on the right of the coin, you can see there's Isaac Newton, and there's also John Hamden, who was a hero of the Civil War. And the reason for that is that this is a political statement. It's a political coin. Isaac Newton was a very, very strong supporter of the Whig Party, which came in after the Glorious Revolution. And he was twice the Member of Parliament for University of Cambridge. Until the 20th century, the University of Cambridge and the University of Oxford had their own MPs who went to Parliament, and that was Isaac Newton twice. And it was Conduit who owned the bust of Newton that you can see on the mantelpiece. It's Conduit's drawing room. And the plaque below wasn't probably wasn't really there, but it was copied from the one on Isaac Newton's monument in Westminster Abbey, which you may have seen. It was enormously expensive and Conduit paid for it himself. And I think the monument's interesting because it indicates how Newton was perceived immediately after his death, which isn't necessarily exactly the same as now. And so this is what it looked like when it was installed before that 19th century decorative screen was added. And it's a very, very prominent position right at the head of the nave. And we know now uh, the, the nave of Westminster Abbey has got lots and lots of monuments in and it's got Poets' Corner, but Newton was one of the first monuments to be erected there. Before that, uh, all the statues were behind the altar and they were mostly of saints or monarchs. So during the Enlightenment period, during the 18th century, the nave became a place for celebrating intellectual achievements. And it, also the people who were chosen to go in there collectively endorsed the maxims of the Whig Party, which were constitutional monarchy, anti-Catholicism and individual freedom. So if we go back, we can actually see better on this picture. So you can see that Newton's resting his elbow on four books and two of them, you'd expect the titles are Gravity and Optics. But there's also two more, Theology and Chronology. And those books were published after he died by John Conduit, who sorted through all his manuscripts. You left an enormous box after box after box of manuscripts. And these two were published after he died. So I'll start by talking briefly about ancient chronology. If you look at the globe at the top, you can see there's Urania, 
draped on top of it. Urania was the muse of astronomy. And it's absolutely typical of the iconography of this period that the muse of astronomy or of mathematics or of reason or truth, they're always shown as women. But of course, women weren't really allowed to practice the sciences. And it's a celestial globe, which means that what you can see on the surface is the constellations as they would be seen by an imaginary person placed at the centre of the globe. And what they show on this particular globe is, um, is the, how the constellations were at the time of the voyage of the Argonauts. And that's because Newton was trying to use his astronomical powers of prediction, because obviously you can retrodict, you can go back into the past once you've got all the right mathematical equations. And he tried to correlate events that were recorded in history with astronomical events that he could calculate from his figures. And he concluded that the voyage of the Argonauts had taken place 300 years earlier than most people thought. Now, that might not now seem terribly exciting, but at the time, it was seen as being very important. The study of chronology was very significant. And this is praised by Edward Gibbon, who wrote a very, very famous book about the Roman Empire. The name of Newton raises the image of a profound genius, luminous and original. You expect now to hear about gravity, but you don't. His system of chronology would alone be sufficient to assure him immortality. And for Newton, these timetables of ancient history were intertwined with biblical accounts and divine cosmology. So studying the Bible was one of his major occupations, particularly the book of Daniel. And this is a drawing that he made of the Temple of Solomon, which is mentioned in the Bible. And he believed that the temple was the physical manifestation on, of earth, or of a divine abode. It was as though it were God's blueprint for the universe. And he spent a long time trying to work out what its exact dimensions were. And he wrote, temples were anciently contrived to represent the frame of the universe as the true temple of the great God. Now, if we go back to the picture, and um, you can see John Condor is a portrait at the top, and beneath that is uh, Newton's niece, Catherine Barton. And she was probably around 17 when she arrived in London. She got her own set of rooms in Newton's house, the one you can see on the right. And he supported her financially, and um, she looked after him as his housekeeper. And she was certainly very fond of her. It's, it's very frustrating because when people live together, they don't have any need to write to each other. So there's only one surviving letter that Newton wrote to Catherine Barton. And it was when she was staying with some friends because she was recovering from smallpox. And he wrote, pray let me know by your next how your face is and if your fever be going. Perhaps warm milk from the cow may help to abate it. I am your very loving uncle, Isaac Newton. It sounds like a bit of a weird prescription, warm milk. But it makes sense when you remember that the first uh, smallpox vaccination were made using cowpox. Uh, and dairy maids were often less susceptible to smallpox than other people. Now, Catherine Barton was a very close friend of Charles Montague. He was also known as the Earl of Halifax. He was the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He played a key role in founding the Bank of England. And he was Newton's major patron. And it was common knowledge that the Earl of Halifax and Catherine Barton, who was supposedly very beautiful, Catherine Barton and Halifax were having an affair. And there was an awful lot of gossip and speculation and there still is, about exactly what happened. And I'm just going to tell you some of the facts, and you can draw your own conclusions about the extent to which Newton was being bribed to keep quiet or whether he wasn't. So I'll just tell you some of the facts. It was, Newt uh, sorry, it was Halifax who secured Newton's position at the Mint. He wrote to him, in 1696, the king's promised me to make Mr. Newton warden of the mint. The office is the most proper for you. Tis the chief officer in the mint is worth five or six hundred per annum per year. 
Let me see you as soon as you come to town, that I may carry you to kiss the king's hand. And then Newton rushed down to London, but then, and became master of the mint. And in 1706, Newton, at the Earl of Halifax, changed his will, and he bequeathed three thousand pounds, a lot of money, and all his jewels to Barton. And then in 1712, he increased the legacy, 5,000 plus two country estates and annuity or annual payment, in recognition of the great esteem he had for her wit and most exquisite understanding. Halifax also made sure that Newton was knighted in Cambridge. And ostensibly, this was a political event because Newton had supported him uh, politically. He'd been a member of parliament supporting the Whig party. And he was knighted by Queen Anne at Cambridge University. And the university put on a pretty grand show. There was a big procession up the main road. The ways were all along strode with flowers, the bells rung and the conduits run with wine. And the picture on the right is the dining hall at Trinity College, and there was a huge feast there. And they put a big sort of makeshift throne on the platform at the end. And Queen Anne was there five feet above everybody else. And Newton and several other people were knighted. And Newton was obviously pretty proud of that because that summer he spent working out his family tree. And you can see it's a pretty complicated family tree. And I put two red arrows in. And the red arrow to the sort of to the center, slightly to the left at the bottom, that shows you where Sir Isaac Newton is himself. And he's traced all his origins back. And then the other arrow is way over on the right. And you can see that's another Newton, but he's called Sir John Newton. And you can see it's a pretty distant relationship. Uh, but Newton claimed his affiliation to Sir John Newton. He filed his pedigree at the College of Arms and this he was his coat of arms. He acquired the family crest. So I'm going to turn now and I'm going to talk a bit, a little bit about the audience. Everybody in the audience can be identified, but I'm going to talk about this particular young man with the red arrow on his face. And that was Prince William. And he was one of the sons of the royal couple, Princess Caroline and Prince George, who later became king and queen. William was very interested in science and Newton arranged that Edmund Halley, the famous astronomer, would be his tutor. And he had a little laboratory and a printing press down in the basement. And Hogarth painted a separate picture of him on the left, but the one I'm more interested in is the one on the right was Princess Caroline. And you can see at the bottom right, there's two cherubs, 18th century painters love cherubs, and they're carrying a basket, a basket of flowers, but it's actually a basket that's got seven babies' heads in. And that's because she had seven children who were all alive, and that was, she was comparing herself, she commissioned this picture, she was comparing herself with Queen Anne, the previous queen who died without any children at all, and that had represented a great problem for the succession. And the two cherubs on the left are holding a crown and also a laurel wreath, and they're there to indicate her intellectual interests. And she was a very, very clever woman. She was far cleverer than her husband, George. And as soon as she arrived in London from Germany, she started gathering an intellectual court around her. And one of the people she attracted to her court was Isaac Newton. And so Newton was obviously very pleased to receive her royal patronage, and it made him look pretty good at the Royal Society when he could talk about all his visits to Queen Caroline. And they used to have long conversations together. And in particular, he was very pleased to discover that she was fascinated by his chronological studies and she was also very interested in theology. So they had lots of conversations about theology. Another great bonus for him 
was um, that she took his sides in arguments with Leibniz, the German philosopher and mathematician. And famously, Leibniz and Newton had a lifelong row continued by their supporters about who invented calculus first. But the debate that Caroline was involved in wasn't about calculus, it was about theology. Newton and Leibniz had very difficult, different philosophical ideas about the role of God in the universe. Newton believed that God constantly intervened. He sent some sort of matter, animated matter or force in on the tails of comets, whereas Leibniz said that God wound up the universe at the beginning like a clock and then left it to tick along by itself. And Caroline became an important intermediary in a protracted row that went on between them. She recruited a man called Samuel Clark. He was one of London's leading theologians, and she recruited him to help her. And so she would get letters from Leibniz, and then she would consult Clark, and Clark would go and consult Newton. And all these conversations went on for several years. And after a while, a book was published. Uh, it's called the um, Clark Leibniz Correspondence. And it was one of the books which really was very influential in early 18th century England to persuade people that Newton's philosophy was right. It wasn't an overnight conversion. A lot of work had to be done to convince everybody that Newton was right. And naturally, because she's a woman, her name doesn't appear on the title page. But Princess Caroline played an absolutely crucial role in negotiating between these three men. And it's a very good example of how important women could be in 18th century science, uh, but they're very rarely recognized. So now I'll talk to the stage, the children's play that was taking place. They were acting the Indian Emperor or the Conquest of Mexico by the Spaniards. It was an old play by John Dryden. It had been revived. And the good thing about it from the point of view of English audiences was that John Dryden really emphasised how brutal and invasive the Spaniards were when they uh, went to the Americas. And that for, was good for, gave a very sort of feel good effect for English audiences. And it was an old play, but it's got about, a lot about liberty and honour in it. And they were very important buzzwords in the 18th century as well. And it was also about colonial expansion, which is why I'm very interested in it. So in the very first scene, you got two of these Spanish conquerors arriving on the coast. And they say, methinks we walk in dreams on fairyland where golden ore lies mixed with common sand. And then... God, they say, God has left it there for the Europeans. Heaven from all ages wisely did provide this wealth and for the bravest nation hide. The, and um, in the 18th century, that was exactly how the English felt. They felt there was lots of gold in the Americas and also in Africa, and that they, as English people, deserved to have it. So... One early example of uh, this exploitation was the South Sea Company, which was set up in uh, London. It was set up to um, go over to the Americas and um, ship over enslaved peoples uh, from Africa and use those peoples to dig up the gold and ship it back uh, to, to Britain. And it was set up as a company and the sh it was very, very profitable at the beginning and the shares rose and rose and rose and then they, it suddenly collapsed and it's now called the South Sea Bubble. It happened in uh, 1720, 200 years ago last year. Um, Isaac Newton, we think he's so clever and so brilliant, but he lost a fortune in the South Sea Bubble. So you can see from that graph, he started off very sensibly, invested a bit and then the share price went up and he left. He'd made a profit. And then he, he did the absolute classic. He saw everybody else getting rich. So he re-entered at a much higher price than he'd sold for. And then he sat there and he watched the price of the shares go up and then suddenly it collapsed and he exited having lost a small fortune. But of course, Britain's 
expectations weren't so much in, um, in South America, Britain as an imperial power focused in the 18th century on Africa. And you can see here a 17th, an 18th century map of the west coast of Africa. And you can see at the, at the bottom, there's Guinea. And the old coins that we used to have um, in the 20th century, they were called Guineas after this area of Africa. And I'm not sure if you can read but go, um, well enough on the slide. But going across um, from left to right, from west to east on the sort of horizontal bit, you can see it's it's got the grain coast, the gold coast, and then it's got the silver coast. So what the British had done when they drew this map is to name the different parts of Africa, not after the people who were living there, but after the grain and the gold and the slaves that they could retrieve and bring over to Europe. And of course, there was a triangular trade in which Britain sent out manufactured goods like guns and cotton material over to Africa. And then the going rate was roughly one gun for one enslaved person who could, was then sent over to the Americas to work in the plantations or uh, to labor down silver mines. And then tobacco and sugar and other raw materials like silver, for example, was sent over to Europe, particularly to Britain. And there's no evidence that Newton was personally involved in slave trading, but he definitely benefited from it. So he benefited indirectly from all the investments he made, and also because he was very concerned with the Gold Coast through his position as the mint. So this is the new coin that was called the guinea, that was minted out of African gold. And coins were very different then from now. Now, if you've got a pound coin or a two pound coin, there's no idea that the metal in it is actually worth very much. But back in the 17th and 18th century, coins were made of valuable metal and they were worth the same in principle as it said on the face of the coin. So this guinea started off as a sovereign, as uh, what we might now call a pound. But as gold got more and more and more valuable, the value of the, this coin rose. And at one stage, it was worth uh, 1.5 pounds. And then it, Newton stabilized it at 21 shillings. And right through until the second half of the 20th, uh, the 20th century, there was still in use for legal transactions an amount of money called a guinea, which was uh, what was then called 21 shillings, which is 1.05 pounds. That, that all the technicalities don't matter. The import, important point to remember is that coins were actually worth money in themselves because they were made of valuable metal. So this is a plan of the Royal Mint. And you can see it's the Tower of London. And at the top of the picture, the mint is squeezed in that little alleyway between the two fortifications. And Newton was first warden, then master of the mint, which was roughly equivalent to being the governor of the Bank of England today. It was a very powerful economic position. He was an incredibly efficient manager. So these were some of the machines that he introduced. And he also was very keen on time and motion study. So he made people, his staff, work far, far, far quicker than they had done before. So productivity shot up, which meant that he was very unpopular. So you can see on the left, there's a machine uh, for making coins. What you can't see is normally there'd be a third man sitting at the bottom who would feed in blank coins, had to get his fingers out pretty quickly so they didn't get squashed. And then these two other men are working really hard, uh, pushing, uh, walking around so that the press goes down and prints the pattern onto the coin. And he had, he had these two men working very, very hard. And on the right, insert, you can see another type of machine. And that machine was invented to put a milled edge onto the coin, those little ridges that are around the rim of a coin. 
And the reason for that is because in 1696, Newton's first job when he landed at the Mint was to um, produce a complete recoinage. So on the left, you can see an Elizabethan round shilling and it's made of silver, so it's valuable in itself. And you can see it's got a very sort of jagged edge. And that's because criminals called clippers used to go around and they used to shave bits of silver off the edge of the coin. Then they could melt down those bits of silver and sell them at a profit. So the, the actual coins, the currency of the country, were literally shrinking. And so the solution that was prescribed for that was to tell everybody to bring in all their old silver coins to the mint. They would then be melted, melted down and the new silver coins that you can see on the right would be produced themselves. It didn't work very well. And it was a sort of typical situation that when you have something like a change in the money, rich people got richer and the poor people got poorer. And one big problem was that because the silver coins and the gold coins were in themselves so valuable, what uh, rich people did was buy up lots of coins, melt them down into bullion, and then ship them over to China, where they were paid far more than the money in England uh, was worth. So all the English money was all literally disappearing. It was being melted down and sent over to China. So so a lot of business people were making a huge deal of profit. There was also a lot of forgery going on. And one of Newton's responsibilities was to chase the forgers, and he was absolutely ruthless. And several people were executed. He sent a lot of people to prison. And this is a comment by um, one man who was in Newgate Prison, which was a pretty horrific place. He called Newton a rogue, and if ever King James came again, King James was uh, before the glorious revolution of 1688. If ever King James came again, he would shoot him, and the said ball made answer, God damn my blood, so will I, and though I don't know him yet, I'll find him out. All these criminals absolutely loathed him. The Newton was running the mint like a business, so he... His own activities had to be supervised. So every year, there was a big ceremony called the Trial of the Picks. The Picks is a word for a special chest. And this trial still takes place every year. During the year, a random selection of coins produced at the mint are put into this chest called a Picks. And then every year, when Newton was... Um, was master of the mint. Once a year, he used to be rowed on a barge down the river to Westminster, and this pix was taken with him. And when they got to Westminster, representatives from the Goldsmiths Association were there to test the gold coins and see if they had enough gold in them. So what you can see on the left is a 19th century ceremony of the trial of the picks, but it was probably pretty similar in the 18th century. And on the right, what you can see, it's called an assaying plate, and it's a, it's a gold standard. And this one was made during Isaac Newton's regime of uh, 1707. And what the goldsmiths did was test the coins and see if the percentage of gold in the coins matched the percentage of gold in the assay plate. And if it didn't, then they accused Newton of swindling uh, because he wasn't putting enough gold into the coins. He was keeping the gold for himself. I'm going to show you a picture now, which I warn you, it's, it's not very distressing. It's not a very pleasant picture. It's a modern picture and it shows illegal gold mining in Ghana. And I imagine that these were the sort of conditions that Africans were working in under during the 17th and 18th centuries, while Newton was master of the mint. Now, as I said, Newton wasn't directly involved in, in, um, in this sort of forced labor. On the other hand, as master of the mint, he made sure that he got the lowest possible prices from African traders. He was also paid a fee for every coin that was minted, which is one reason why he became so rich. And he also invested in the South Sea Company and the East India Company, which were making their profits from slavery. 
And as an added advantage, he also benefited scientifically from global training. So th this is a map of some of the major trade routes that were in existence. And when he was revising the Principia for its second edition, he needed measurements from all over the world of tides to check his data. And so the obvious place to get tides is from people stationed in ports, and they were mostly merchants who were involved in global commerce. So he collected um, measurements from all around the world. And you see, this is his annotated copy of the Principia. This is still in Cambridge University Library. And what he did was he took a copy of the Principia to pieces, and then he had blank pages inserted, and then he had the book rebound. So what you can see on the left of this is the printed page of the Principia, and what you can see on the right is all the corrections that he made with the help of all these new measurements of the tides and various other measurements. Those were the revisions that he made before the second edition was published. And then there was a third edition. So what's now revered as the world's greatest book on physics incorporated information that had been gleaned from British colonizers who were both exploring and exploiting the globe. So I presented a rather different version of Isaac Newton from usual. And I'm going to end by thinking about how he might have wanted to be remembered. So there's a famous Apple story. And in the last few years of his life, he suddenly started telling people um, about the falling apple. So I imagine he would have been very happy to know that that myth has grown and grown and grown. And it's what everybody now associates with Isaac Newton. He also commissioned many portraits, and this one on the right was his favourite, and you can see how elegant he looks in his crimson velvet jacket. And he chose this picture for the engraving in the third edition of the Principia, which became the standard version. So that's the engraving on the right. But we've got some testimony from an American who was visiting the Royal Society, and he said Newton didn't really look quite like the portrait. By all those who have seen him of late, bending so much under the load of years as that with some difficulty mounted the stairs, that youthful representation will, I be fear, be considered rather as an object of ridicule than respect, and much sooner raise pity than esteem. So these are some of the ways that Isaac Newton chose to be poor trade during the last 30 years of his life. And in modern currency, this little collection is probably worth, cost him several hundred thousand pounds. So these pictures, they're all very different from each other. And my account is probably rather different from the one that you're familiar with. And the point is, there isn't any right or wrong version of Isaac Newton. That's what one of the joys of history you can interpret. It's always different ways of looking at him. But I hope you've enjoyed listening uh, to the way I think about him. And I will now stop sharing and come out of this and be able to see you, I hope. Yes, I think we can all see you on our screens. So that's wonderful. Thank you so much for the um, amazing talk. I was very, I was pleasantly surprised to learn that Newton was a very efficient manager. Um, let's have a look at some of the questions that came in through your talk. Editor, may we have the first question, please? What did he do as the master of the mint? I mean, of course, he presumably commissioned the coins to be minted. Um, well, he had, there was actually, there were actually at the time, I didn't go into this, but there were uh, several mint offices. There was the main mint office in London, uh, but there were several others uh, dotted around the country. And he, it was his job to make sure that they all worked efficiently. And there were various sort of local disputes. So for example, um, Jonathan Swift, who was a great, the novelist who, who, and satirist who wrote Gulliver's Travels. He was a great friend of Catherine Barton. Uh, but he, uh, he was also, he was Irish. And one of the rows that Newton got into was because um, Dublin wanted to coin, make its own coins. And as master of the mint, Newton decreed that the coins for Ireland were going to be made in Bristol. And then I described this trial of the picks where coins were tested. And instead of sending one of his mint representatives over to the factory at Bristol, 
Uh, Newton just accepted some coins that the head of the Mint at Bristol sent into London and said, oh, yes, they're all right. This is all operating um, perfectly. Whereas, in fact, of course, Ireland felt very, very resentful that uh, Dublin wasn't producing its own coins. And it was also quite clear that there was plenty of opportunity for cheating going on. So, so I think one of the things he was responsible for was running every single mint in the country. There were about five or six mints. He was responsible for running the mint like a business. He had to make a profit. He had to pay the wages. He, he, he had pages and pages and pages of accounts that he kept. He had to, he, there's also pages of surviving documents of him translating, transforming different currencies from one to the other because we had um, pennies and pounds and shillings, whereas uh, in, in obviously in France they had francs and then in Spain they had some other currency and they were all done in, in very strange sort of way. They weren't the metric system hadn't been introduced. So it was he had to do a huge amount of arithmetic, keeping the accounts straight and converting money from one thing, uh, from one currency to another and trying as hard as he could to make sure that England's currency got back on a level keel. At one stage, there wasn't much money around and you couldn't really buy anything. You had to take a little scales with you every time you went shopping because he had to weigh the coins to show how much silver or gold that there was in the coin. So it was all absolutely chaotic. So one of his big jobs was to revive the currency and sort it out. That definitely sounds like a pretty arduous and full-time job for Newton. Well, it does was. That, yeah. Does that mean yeah. that his scientific career suffered or he stopped well, he was still, as much books? He was still president of the Royal Society, but he didn't. Wow. He did some, he did, yeah, he did some. He did some research um, while he was in London, uh, but not nearly as much as he had done before. He finished his book on optics, which was basically um, experiments that he'd done previously. He published that in 1704, and that was conveniently the year after Robert Hooke had died. Robert Hooke was his great enemy, so he had one of the things he was very active at was having arguments with people. So I've already mentioned the argument with Leibniz. He also, Robert Hooke, uh, who discovered Hooke's Law, was another of his great enemies. And then John Flamsteed. John Flamsteed was the first... The royal he was the royal astronomer, absolutely right. He was the first royal astronomer at Greenwich. And there was a huge row between them because Flamsteed said that all the data belonged to him and Isaac Newton wanted to get get access to the data. And there was a, another huge row which involved the Queen between them. So he, he he did have enough energy to pursue a lot of arguments. He must have been a brilliant man, as we all know. May we have the next question, please? What was Hooke's relationship with Newton? Ah, that's exactly following the, um, exactly. the, the answer you just gave after the Principia was printed. Well, Hooke accused Newton of plagiarism. Hooke accused Newton of stealing his own ideas on optics and his own ideas um, that that if you if you have a, a um, an ellipse like the planets are moving in ellipse that so that's governed by the one over r squared uh, relationship. And Hooke always claimed that Newton had stolen these ideas from him. And there's um, a very famous statement uh, by Newton that's often quoted, that if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And there's two interesting things, I think, about that quotation. One is that Newton didn't invent that. It was actually invented in the 12th century uh, by a French um, clerical person at the, at the Cathedral of Chartres. Mm -hmm. so, Seeing further by standing on the shoulders of giants was already a very, very well-known expression. But uh, Hooke wrote a letter to Newton accusing him of plagiarism. And Newton wrote this angry letter back. And he said, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. And what he meant was, well, I wouldn't, you know, I have no need to stand on your shoulders because I'm clever enough to do it. But also it was much worse than that, I think, because uh, Robert Hooke, we know he had some sort of spinal um, deformity, which got oh. much worse as he got older. And he was a very small man. And from the age of about 16 onwards, he became more and more bent. 
Um, so to say that I wouldn't start, you know, it's, like, not I unkind. Start <laughs> it's not unkind, it's absolutely horrible. <laughs> it's a really, really, really nasty thing to say. Um, but so, no, his relationship with Hook was not good. And so when Hook, as I said, when Hook died, um, then Newton felt safe in publishing the optics. And also, I showed you the picture at the beginning of Newton's portrait uh, with his name in gold lettering. So one of the things he did when he first became president of the Royal Society was to encourage all the fellows to donate their portraits and have, have them painted in gold at the top. But it's very odd that no portraits of Hook survive. It's as though they all disappeared during that great transition. And so, I mean, they've disappeared. We don't know where they've disappeared, but, you know, there's speculation. So as far as we know, they did not get on very well. I think that's the first to say. May we have the next question, please? What were some of Newton's other interests besides science? I know he was a very religious man, as you uh, as you told us in your talk, but he was deep, deeply religious. I, I've mentioned the ancient chronology. He um, he did definitely did not like poetry. He did not like art. He once went to an opera, but he walked out after the first <gasps> act. Um, there's an in inventory of his library, and one of the things that's very striking is that he didn't have all the books like I know Paradise Lost. Um, and books like that, which would have been absolutely standard for any educated English gentleman. Uh, he was um, he was interested basically in the Bible and in physics. He was, of course, also extremely interested in alchemy, and he wrote more manuscripts on alchemy than on anything else. But, I mean, I, I, alchemy isn't some sort of arcane subject that's completely distinct from his scientific interest. That, I think that counts as, as science. So, so um, he didn't have a great range. <laughs> well, ancient chronology, theology, and uh, natural philosophy. But it's quite a lot for one man. Indeed. Not, well, we, we usually think of him as a polymath. I think that's, that's sufficient. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think he's not a polymath because he knew very little, uh, surprisingly little, about the arts. I mean, like poetry and um, visual arts and music. He doesn't seem to be been interested in those at all. Hmm, that's fair enough. I guess you can't be brilliant at everything. That'll be a bit unfair yes, to I, don't, I don't think he was a, a, a polymath's interested in everything, so I, I don't think he was. No, okay. But that's not to understate his, you know, he was obviously extremely gifted at what he did. How would you comment on the fact that he was very much religious and his scientific interests? Because from a 21st century standpoint, we will say that these two things don't seem to be terribly compa compatible. Yes, but that, that's certainly true, but it was completely different in the 17th and 18th centuries. The whole point of studying the universe um, or the cosmos or the earth for, for um, men of science, the whole point was to get nearer to God. Um, the, um, the word laboratory comes from Latin, and the first bit, the lab bit, comes from I work, like labor. And the second bit, oratory, comes from I pray. So the, the, the whole idea in, in England, right through to the 19th century, the whole point was to discover God's plan for the universe, to look at the universe and celebrate God's wisdom in having made something so perfect and so, so wonderful. So natural philosophy and religion absolutely went hand in hand quite close together and Newton um, uh, in the second edition of the Principia he added a little bit which is about eight pages long uh, where he tried to clarify his position on God and for him God God was he used the word imminent God is ever ever present in the universe God is time God is space and God can, his God, his version of God can intervene in the universe. So he's deeply religious. And this idea, the separation of religion and science was something that developed during the 19th century and certainly wasn't there in the 17th and 18th. Right, that's very good to clear up. And I'm surprised to learn that the broad tree actually comes from the fact that I work and I pray. I never have thought about that before, but that's interesting to know. I, I probably won't be doing much praying in the lab, but, <laughs> we'll keep it in mind. <laughs> Maybe have the next question, please. 
how was Newton able to change the currency of England without creating a monetary chaos? I mean, we 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 well, heard he, he did it. it. <laughs> well, yeah, well, well, there was monetary chaos, and I mean, one of his great jobs was to try and calm it down. And uh, what I've told you, I showed you that picture of a guinea, and I said originally it was worth a pound, and then it, Newton fixed it at twenty-one shillings because the guinea soared. And it was worth a huge amount of money. And we now, the the standard metal, the, the standard currency it is based on gold. But at the time, it was everybody else followed a silver standard. And silver and gold were both changing in value at the same time. So it was really chaotic. And Newton managed to stabilize the situation by fixing the guinea at 21 shillings, 1.05 pounds. And so England, thanks to Newton, was the first country to go on the gold standard rather than onto the silver standard. Right, I don't know and much he also, about it. He also introduced something called, um, I think it's called sterling silver. So if you have objects that are made of silver, like vases and things, they had to have a higher percentage of silver in them than the coins because otherwise everybody would be melting them down and shipping them off to China. So yeah, it was that it was a, it was a big problem. Right. I'm no economist, but I'm sure whatever monetary policy he did was wise. Now go to the next question, please. What was Queen Caroline's contribution to the progress of science, apart from the fact that he settled arguments, I guess? Uh, so she's uh, well, I, I, she was I think she she was very interested in science and she was also a great patron of science. So for instance, um, Isaac, Isaac Newton's assistant at the Royal Society was a man called Desaguliers, and he also worked for Princess Caroline. Um, Edmund Halley uh, tutored her children. Um, she, she she thought science was the way to the future. Another thing that she did was promote variolation. Variolation was um, a way of uh, infecting people with a low dose of smallpox to build up their resistance so that hopefully they didn't contract smallpox later on. It was a method that was brought back from Turkey and it was before smallpox inoculation was developed. And she was very, very keen on doing that. And she had all her children variolated as it was called variola is the latin for smallpox so she had them all infected with small doses of smallpox and luckily they all survived and they never got seriously ill and so that was another example of how she did that to promote variolation to the whole country so she was very keen on scientific progress she had a, a big display gallery which you can still see at Ken uh, kensington palace and uh, she put lots of scientific instruments in there. So she was a huge sponsor and promoter of science, even though she didn't practice herself. And she was a very intelligent woman. Wow, it's good to know that we have um, found well, the earliest promoter of immunization um, to protect us against infectious diseases, which is very yeah. current uh, at the moment, exactly, given that yeah. COVID vaccines are being rolled out. Um, mm -hmm. Right, we have the next question. We'll probably have a few more before we have to finish the talk. So, okay. was Newton's financial interests, as opposed to his science, a driving force behind his life and career? I guess the difference on what time you're talking about, but I think it depends what time you're talking about. I think we'd have to ask Isaac Newton that question. Um, so um, he he did actually even when he was a student. Uh, he was interested in money because he used to lend money to other students and charge them interest on it. So he, <laughs> he had a little business going there. Uh, as Lucasian professor, the post that he held at Cambridge, he the sal his salary was a hundred pounds a year, which was quite reasonable. But I mean, when when he went down to London, I mean, his salary was vastly higher than that. And it's one of the interpretations that I'm making is that he was interested in financial gain. I mean, because there's so, so much mythology about Newton. And one of the ideas is that, that he just wasn't interested. He did everything for the sake of science and couldn't think of anything else. So I've just tried to paint a picture of a different sort of Newton, primarily at a different time of his life. Um, but he was also very interested in his family's prop 
property. Uh, the house that he owned at Woolsthorpe had quite a lot of property that went with it, so he, he had a considerable wealth there. He also, he was very good right till the end of his life. He went on showing an interest in his family that lived in Lincolnshire, and naturally, uh, as, as he got more and more rich, various relatives appeared out of the woodwork that he'd never met before but said well dear Isaac you might not remember me but I'm your second cousin twice removed and I think you ought to have some money to support me. Wow I guess this trouble is always um it's always been there ever throughout history these um relatives coming along um anyways oh, maybe we have the next question please. Well, what's what was Newton's view on your... yes um well, well, I don't have an explicit view. One of the things that he wanted to do was to protect British manufacture. So he was very much in favour of the government imposing high taxes on imported goods, and that was that encouraged um, local artisans and craftspeople to produce stuff at home. Um, so there, there was he, he he said that you shouldn't buy things like. Indian silk and um, I don't know Chinese porcelain. Uh, so it is in the inventory that I mentioned. Round his bed, he's got there's something called harateen, and I had to look that up in the dictionary. And harateen is an 18th century English kind of woolen cloth. And what English people did was imitate all these foreign imports, and so then they could under undercut them. And harateen was one of the cloths um, that was part of that project so newton was very keen on promoting home industry and home production um i as far as i'm aware there's no record of what he actually thought about imperialism but he um he invested in the east india company so he obviously to some extent he thought it was a good idea hmm. fair enough i guess there's not really any way we can tell since he didn't left any writing about these subject yeah, but you, I think also you have to sort of set him in the context of the time. I mean, it's very it's very easy to judge people retrospectively and say, how, mm -hmm. could, how could they possibly behave like that? But the whole British economy uh, depended on the international trade and enslaved peoples. And so I'm good, I, I don't want to single Newton out as being yeah. singularly corrupt or wicked. But on, on the other hand, you know, he, he had that. I, ivory bust and ivory plaque and he had knives with ivory handles so he knew quite well where the ivory came from and perhaps he perhaps like many other people he chose not to think about all the suffering endured by humans as well as by elephants to make sure that that ivory came back to Britain I have no idea how much he thought about that sort of no, it's true. times has changed yeah. everything's very different yeah. Right. We'll have one last question before we ha will have to let Patricia go. Okay. Let's have the last question. Oh, that's okay. quite a long question. He could have written his discoveries if he hadn't, if he didn't have such a close relationship with the Royal Society. Well, when he when he published uh, the Principia, um, he was forced into publishing it by Edmund Halley, and they asked the Royal Society. Uh, to publish it, and the Royal Society refused because um, they just published this massive um, encyclopedia about fish uh, by a man called Willoughby, and this, in, this big book about fish had made a substantial loss, and so the Royal Society wasn't willing to underwrite the cost of printing Isaac Newton's Principia. So he first became famous in 1672 he first became famous not for his work on gravity, but for inventing a new telescope. It was um, a, reflect, a reflecting telescope rather than a refracting telescope. He used, he used mirrors rather than lenses. And that was how he first became famous, and his first paper was published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. So in that sense, he relied on the Royal Society. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, they weren't willing to pay for the publication. It was Edmund Halley who paid for it, actually. Well, they will regret that decision because now we know that the Principia is one of the most famous books in science. Exactly. We'll have one last question. I just realized that we've uh, missed one of the questions from the audience. So that will be the last question of this talk. Um, okay. There we go. Was Newton's discovery of gravity a logical next step of what was known at the time? Because this uh, is what science. Certainly, so he certainly 
relied on a lot of previous discoveries. I mean, I think it's very easy to think that Newton sort of appeared out of nowhere and suddenly invented gravity and overturned all the ideas that dated back from Aristotle. Um, but there was a whole succession of people who made different discoveries. I mean, most famous, obviously, Copernicus and Galileo, but Kepler was also very influential because of his three, three laws of the planets. So I, I don't think I think it needed a lot of working out. Um, I, I, his, um, science isn't if you say something like the logical next step, then that sort of summons up a model that there's a straight road going up a hill, and you're going from ignorance up up to truth. But it's not like that at all. For one thing, we don't really know what truth is, that's very debated. But science tends to sort of branch off in odd directions as individuals come along and have different ideas. And I don't think, I don't think it was necessary for him to discover the theory of gravity, but it did definitely depend on a huge number of discoveries that had happened previously. We all stand on the shoulders of giants. That's well, what this yeah. hook will appreciate. Unless, unless, hook. <laughs> unless it's hook, indeed. Okay, I think that's all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much to our speaker, Dr. Patricia Farah, for coming today. Um, we wish all we wish all the best of luck to your book, Life After Gravity. Um, thank you to our audience for your attention. Thank you to our committee members for making this possible. Um, next week. We'll be welcoming the author of The Human Cosmos. So Thursday again, stay tuned. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the evening. Okay, and thank you, everybody who's here. Thank you very much for coming. And for